We have two readings today. The first is from Mark chapter 6, verses 53 to 56. When they had crossed over, they came to the land at Gennesaret and moored the boat. When they got out of the boat, people at once recognized him and rushed in the whole region and began to bring the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, into villages or cities or farms, they laid the sick in marketplaces and begged him that they might touch even the fringe of his cloak. And all who touched it were healed. In Acts chapter 3, verses 1 to 10, one day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And a man lame from birth was being carried in. People would lay him daily at the gate of the temple called the Beautiful Gate so that he could ask for alms from those who were entering the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked them for alms. And Peter looked at him intently and said, look at me, look at John. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to re receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver or gold, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. Jumping up, he stood and he began to walk, and he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising God, and they recognized him as the one who used to sit and ask for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Ancient words that can take root and bring good news to us. Would you pray with me a moment? Holy God, we find ourselves in the midst of new life breaking forth around us in the trees and the flowers and the buds. In this Easter season, this Easter tide, this time when we open our eyes to that profound mystery, Christ is risen, Christ is risen indeed. May that message resonate by the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts, and the conversations and actions we might take this week. Make it so, holy God, by the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray and say together, Amen. So I'm working on a sermon series from the Worship Design Studio, and it's called Just As He Told You, and it's a collection of biblical stories um, with particular almost instructions. The subtitle of the series is When All Else Fails, Read the Instructions. So it's focusing on uh, maybe some particular lessons or instructions that we can take away um, from both the text and our interpretation of it. So, um, Heartbreak to Healing is, uh, is the title for today, and I'm starting in what might seem like a, a weird place with a map of the United States. Partly because I've got the uh, Seekers class on my mind, and one of the things that I do is try to teach a little bit about our larger church, not just our local church. So you're looking at a map of the United States, and there are um, all the multiple colors represent different conferences of the United Church of Christ. And you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out that most of them involve states. Um, here in New England, where there's a congregational church in every single town virtually, um, there are therefore lots of churches, and so the conferences are divided by state. As you move west, uh, here's the Central Atlantic Conference, and it's New Jersey, Maryland, and Virginia. If you go here, the Rocky Mountain Conference, Colorado, Wyoming, and Utah, do you notice a pattern here as you move west? More territory, fewer churches. If you look where we are, the Central Pacific Conference, it's Oregon and Idaho. Now, why would I begin from heartbreak to healing with a map of the conferences? Well, here's why. 
Every time I have switched conferences, I've served in the Maine Conference, the New York Conference, Central Atlantic Conference, Rocky Mountain Conference, and now Central Pacific Conference. Um, each time you go to a conference, you, you get interviewed by people that look something like this, a collection of people that would look like some from our congregation. The difference is when I met with the Committee on Ministry when I went to the Central Atlantic Conference, something about these oceans that I seem to be drawn to, Central Atlantic, Central Pacific, um, it was, uh, it was long before everyone had a computer sitting in front of them. So the picture was slightly different in that there weren't so many laptops, but the folks looked about the same. And, and basically what happens is you go in, you meet with these folks, and they ask you questions uh, because they sort of want to know, is this person legit, or do we have to be concerned about them, or what gifts do they bring? You get a feel for it. It's kind of an inventory uh, introduction interview. And so... I said, well, let's see, you know, you got to trot the things out that everybody's expecting, right? So yes, I'm, I'm good at preaching, yes, I, I'm good at leadership, social justice is important to me, pastoral care is good, and I have a ministry of healing, because I had spent two years as a hospital chaplain, and I had seen the power of healing that often didn't exactly happen the way everyone expected maybe it would happen. Now, there was a curmudgeon in the group, who um, kind of looked at me, probably been around the block, you know, maybe a hundred times, and he said, Ministry of Healing? Could you say a little bit more about that? Because I think what he had in mind was sort of a Benny Hinn <laughs> concern that I would wave my coat around or I would hit somebody on the head, knock them over. How many of you have seen those kinds of things? My dad used to say, and you thought professional wrestling was bad. <laughs> so I think he was just making sure, what, what, what exactly do you mean by healing? And what I meant was a ministry of presence and a ministry of anticipating and expecting healing to happen, which might not be the same thing as a magical cure. So healing in the gospel is Paul read from the sixth chapter of Mark's gospel, and I have highlighted here uh, the, the important words. People recognized him, bring the sick, wherever he went, they begged him, all were healed. So here are our instructions. There are some aspects to healing. First of all, we have to see, acknowledge, and trust the one who heals. There's that recognition that people were like, there he is. This is the person who can actually bring to fruition what I pray for. We also see that healing happens everywhere. I don't think it's an accident that that Mark says villages or cities or farms, well, that pretty much wraps up the, the world in which he lives, and, and we'd have to throw in suburbs, probably, or some other uh, ways in which healing happens everywhere. Um, and then the other thing that's interesting, as I mentioned to the children, there's this, this uh, sort of vague they. In other words, there were other people involved in the healing. Somebody had to be an advocate and say, come on, come on, otherwise, people would be left in the shadows. The other thing, and I, you know, I'm not a huge fan of the word beg, but here's why I'm not. Because it is an expression of vulnerability. And it implies weakness. And what this healing story tells us is sometimes if we allow ourselves to be vulnerable, we can actually receive the healing that we need. So there's a deep yearning and awareness of need. And finally, healing's inclusive, not exclusive. All who touched, all were healed. So this continues. In the book of Acts, the third chapter, Interestingly enough, there are some more instructions about what's involved when healing happens. 
Interestingly enough, Peter and John, what were they doing? They were going to pray. Their intention was to go to pray. Their intention was to recognize, be in the presence of, and worship God. I think that that might be a key piece to why things unfolded the way they did. There was a man lame from birth. Now, if you know anything about ancient times when Jesus was walking around, if someone was born with an infirmity from birth, that meant that somebody had sinned. Somewhere along the line, somebody had to pay for this, and unfortunately, this poor soul is the one who is being uh, scapegoated, beaten up, the one who has to absorb the sin. Jesus absolutely did not want people to make that connection. He broke it with the gospel. That's what Peter and John are doing. And of course... Like most beggars, he wanted money, needed it. Exactly, Chevelle. Peter looked intently at him, as did John, and said, look at us, and he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. Here we go again. There's a they, there's an expect, there's a recognition, and there's meeting someone. Don't have any money, but what I give you in the name of Jesus Christ will make a difference to you in a way that a money gift can't. It's not exactly what he said, but that's what he meant. And took him by the right hand, raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And all the people saw him, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Now, I know that there are people sitting in this sanctuary who have for probably many years decided that we're going to chuck out the healing stories because how in the world are we supposed to believe that that actually happened? There's actually um, a famous early founder of our country, Thomas Jefferson, um, who decided to write his own or make his own Bible. So he went through with a big pen. You can see this at his, his home in Charlottesville. And he's crossed out all these things that to his logical mind seem not to make any sense. And this was one of those stories. That's only true if you think that everything in the Bible has to be factually, factually accurate instead of pointing and lifting up a truth. That's what these instructionals, that, that, that's what I'm pulling out from these stories. If we just throw them out, we lose a profound, profound way in which we can be healed. Now, that's not the same thing as praying for a miracle to cure in the way we want it to happen. And I can promise you that in my own life, I have said those prayers, and I don't think there's a darn thing wrong with them. The only problem is if it doesn't happen the way I want it to, then I can feel like the problem is I wasn't faithful enough, right? So then all of a sudden, I'm the victim like the person who had to sit outside at the gate. You with me so far? Making any sense? Okay, good. Just checking. So, is it magic? There are scholars from the early part of the 20th century, you probably all know who this is, right? Sigmund Freud. Sigmund Freud, the who says one of the masters of suspicion who wrote a book called The Future of the Illusion, and he basically said religion is going to die because it's all based on illusion. Does he look like a happy guy to you? <laughs> I am so glad that Freud created the whole concept of psychoanalysis and the way in which the unconscious can can kind of sneak up on us. He was a brilliant man. He made a difference in the world. Unfortunately, he threw the baby out with the bathwater. Because we all know the power of having hope, even if it doesn't make sense. Can I get a witness on that? In fact, why would I get out of bed if that weren't true? I'd just stay there because we know how cruddy the world is, right? 
So here's another face. And some of you may recognize his face, or if you don't recognize his face, you may recognize his name. Anybody know who it is? It's Henry Nowen. Henry Nowen. Did you guess? Did you guess it? Oh no, a different guess. So before I say any more about Henry Nowen, and and I will. So here's my white privilege coming out. Yeah, I know they're all white, three white faces. So. I'll, I'll admit that, but if you look at these faces, which would you aspire to be like? How would you like your life to feel most of the time? Not to say that we don't know what it is to be serious and to know how much evil there is in the world, how bad we can be sometimes, but if we stay stuck there, I don't, I, I, I don't want to be there because there's some good news. So Henry Nouwen, um, he was a Dutch Catholic priest, very bright. His father was a, a, a tax attorney who worked at The Hague. His mother was one of those um, people in the, let's see, he was born in 1924, I think, his mother was very active in the community. Um, she did a lot for orphans and support of community. And she was a very faithful Catholic. And she taught Henry at an early age that Jesus loves you no, no matter what. His tax attorney dad wanted him to be successful, strong, and to make a difference in the world. And Henry said, the first half of my life, I lived with the voice of my father. In the second half of my life, I live by the voice of my mother. His ministry integrated psychology and spiritual disciplines and uh, all kinds of wonderful stuff. He was an integrator of theology. And his academic appointments were impressive. He taught at Harvard Divinity at Yale Divinity School and at Notre Dame. Those are pretty high-flying places, right? So you can't get on the faculty unless you're pretty darn impressive. But here's the interesting thing about Henry Nouwen. He chose to leave that and go work in a community that served severely mentally and physically handicapped people, and that's where most of his deep spiritual teaching came from. Instead of his years in the ivory tower. He served in this community and it was in Ontario, Canada. He also sex uh, struggled with his sexual orientation. Um, he was gay, he didn't come out because he was afraid, especially in his Catholic community, that his work would then be completely debunked and not paid any attention to. So if he, if he believed if he kept it quiet, he would actually reach more people. Um, Anderson Cooper, um, who is gay and is a uh, reporter for CNN, um, actually made reference to Henry Nouwen when he decided to come out because he said, I could understand why Henry Nouwen didn't want to become the gay theologian. Yes, my identity is important, but I don't want it to be the most important thing so that it gets in the way, you know, of the fact that I'm a human being. And I happen to have a way of loving people that's different than the, the norm, what, whatever that is. Um, and so it kind of makes sense why Henry Nouwen didn't come out, but it also contributed to his ability to completely understand one of the titles of his book, which was Wounded Healer. Here's his wisdom. Now, if you, would, um, if you would be so kind as to read this responsively, like we do our, our uh, call to worship, wh wherever you see the bold, I would encourage you to speak together, and I'll read what's unbolded, and together we'll hear these powerful words from his book, The Wounded Healer. Nobody escapes being wounded. Whether physically, emotionally, mentally, or spiritually, the main question is not. So we don't have to be embarrassed, but. 
When our wounds cease to be a source of shame and become a source of healing, we have become wounded healers. So my friends, that's the power of the gospel of these healing stories. And the belief in the early church was that Jesus had the power to do this healing. It was handed on to the apostles. And I believe that we are still asked to be agents of healing, but it doesn't require the miraculous. It doesn't require a coat. It doesn't require illusion. It simply means being transparent that I am a human being. I understand, or I can at least try to understand without giving advice, being present. It's so powerful. And sometimes we don't trust that it's enough. Can I get a witness on that? If we feel helpless, we feel like we're going to spurt something out. Or how many of you have avoided someone because you're not sure what you're supposed to say? Right? This is just real, folks. That's why we're in community. It's why we are together and it is why I believe that the power of the Holy Spirit can equip us for the good work of being supportive wounded healers for one another. Here's my takeaway instructions for you as you go through the week. You can ask yourself, did I offer peace today? Did I bring a smile to someone's face? Did I say words of healing? Did I let go of my anger and resentment? Did I forgive? Did I love? These are the real questions. You can be part of the answer. And the people were heard to say, Amen.